Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. I have with me some, one of my favorite analysts, our former Foreign Secretary, Mr. Kavan Sibel, who's going to talk about what's happening in terms of geopolitics, especially Ukraine, India, US, and a lot of lot of interference in the neighborhood. Namaskar, sir. Thank you so much. Namaskar. My pleasure. Sir, let's start with Bangladesh first, which is like the you know uh, talk of the town, if I may. What do you see happened there? And how is the U.S. now reacting to what happened in that area? Well, there is a general belief that uh, that the U.S. has had uh, some kind of a role in the in the regime change there, uh, and the uh, and this one can say on the basis uh, of uh, certain known facts. One is that uh, the U.S. has never really reconciled itself. Uh, to the creation of Bangladesh against their wishes, and therefore, or, has always had uh, a kind of political prejudice uh, against this country, a kind of a muscle memory in the State Department, you know, against uh, uh, Bangladesh. Um, that is uh, uh, one part. It's a bit like what happened with Iran when they took hostages. Hmm. Uh, a lot of their attitude towards Iran is colored by by this fact. Yeah. Uh, not that this is the principal uh, element in uh, the situation today. Uh, number two, uh, the fact that uh, Yunus is very close to the United States. Uh, he was a Fulbright scholar. He lived there. He he uh, taught there. I think he's got Grameen Foundation, which was set up uh, in the United States. Uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, and uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, have been strong supporters of Yunus. In fact, they lobbied very hard for him to get the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and they have, in fact, uh, uh, parachuted him uh, into the government as the head of the in in interim government. Not that necessarily that's a bad choice, frankly, uh, because all said and done, uh, Yunus uh, may have been very anti Hasina. Because mm. uh, Sina filed cases against against him, and he was actually uh, indicted by the courts. Uh, so he's been openly anti uh, Sina. Uh, it could have been a different person uh, with more pronounced uh, political or Islamic uh, leanings, which has really not happened. And initially, the students supported the idea that he should take over because he has certain reputation on the ground. And then uh, the fact that Tariq Rahman is, uh, has got political asylum in the UK uh, clearly shows that uh, there is also a UK hand in it mm. uh, in the change that has taken place. Uh, the United States in the past, quite surprisingly, uh, was against the trial of, for war crimes of those uh, people who collaborated with the Pakistani military in his genocidal acts in Bangladesh. In fact, to publicly uh, cautioned her against mm. this. Now, why they should uh, do that? After all, they, they call uh, Putin a war criminal and they want him to be uh, tried and all sorts of people uh, uh, are declared as uh, uh, criminals, war criminals and what. And here, why were they actually uh, trying to protect uh, known war criminals uh, yeah. from uh, justice. And then they didn't invite Sheikh Hasina to the two summits for democracy that the uh, United States uh, organized Washington, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that the two things, one, part, partly delegitimized her rule politically, that it was, it was not a, a democratic functioning government. And this then fed into the narrative of all those opposed to uh, Sheikh Hasina, that she was autocratic, she was this and, and she was that. And as you know, there are a lot of NGOs. I saw a figure the other day of the number of NGOs, best supported yeah. NGOs, US supported NGOs in Bangladesh. So that kind of narrative feeds into the activity of the NGOs on the ground and then creates a kind of a ecosystem in which what happened has happened. Uh, it may well be that uh, Sheikh Hasina 
is autocratic, uh, but is Khalid, Khalid Zia or BNP less autocratic or Tariq Rahman less autocratic? So it's not a neat choice between people who are pure uh, Democrats and those who are uh, autocratic or dictatorial. Worse, worse. Although Sheikh Hasina also had a few links with the Islamists, but the BNP uh, and the Jamaat uh, have been together in government. Uh, so now what surprises me is that a uh, couple of things that the United States uh, it doesn't seem to be worried about uh, the Jamaat exerting more and more influence in, in politics. Because, you know, like the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Egypt, Egypt, even even though Egypt had a kind of a secular tradition, if you like, from the time of Nasser, a very anti-Muslim Brotherhood and everything else. Uh, but they finally were able to uh, gain power till they over uh, stretch them until, of course, they made very serious mistakes and the public turned against them and they were ousted by the military regime. What I mean is that it's a well-organized Islamist type of force on the ground can always exert influence on politics, which is much yeah. greater than their numbers uh, justify. And the Jamaat is uh, openly anti-Indian. So why are the Americans not conscious of the problem this can create in terms of India-Bangladesh relations? Now, the complete change in the quality of ties between India and Bangladesh during Sheikh Hasina's uh, rule was a huge asset for us. Hmm. They, uh, she extradited uh, these fellows, uh, these insurgents, anti-Indian insurgents on Bangladesh soil, uh, got rid of them. Uh, and then on issues of transit and connectivity, uh, she made remarkable uh, how should I say, um, uh, decisions uh, which uh, uh, the BNP would have never taken. I mm -hmm. know that from a fact that when I was foreign secretary, I had called on Khalid Azia. And when I raised the issue of transit, she just stopped me. She said, this is not a subject that I can politically discuss with you, as brutal as that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and now you can see the forces on the ground, what they are saying. Uh, blaming India uh, for everything, raising the the new uh, interim foreign minister in his first meeting with our high commissioner uh, raises contentious issues, talks about Tista, talks about the border killings, uh, talks about uh, uh, warns against any interruption of uh, daily needs and supplies and this and that and that. This is not an occasion to raise uh, these kind of issues. Uh, because mm -hmm. such a huge change in Bangladesh, the message should be reassuring and positive, which looks forward to expanding ties, this and that. But that's not what he did. Uh, so, uh, and then when, you know, this whole issue of uh, the water from Tripura flooding of the Komila area, uh, they are blaming us. Uh, we have been, uh, uh, we have issued an elaborate statement to explain that uh, we are not responsible. There's been very heavy rains in the catchment area on the Bangladesh side. Now they've raised the issue of uh, flow of 11,000 QZX uh, from Faraka. Faraka. As if we want to now uh, flood them more, which again, our ministry uh, has had to issue a statement clarifying what the uh, situation is. Apart from that, uh, the uh, what has happened on the ground, burning of our cultural center, Indra Gandhi mm -hmm. Cultural Center, uh, uh, attacking uh, uh, the Hindu minority. With, and what surprises me there is that uh, not only from the Bangladesh side, uh, they're trying to play this down uh, by saying that this is not true. In fact, uh, the students are protecting uh, Hindus and their institutions, uh, that is Muslim students. Uh, and this narrative is also being promoted by certain uh, lobbies in India. Mm. And now the latest is when uh, uh, Biden speaks to our Prime Minister. Uh, the Prime Minister raises the issue of uh, security of minorities in Bangladesh, including uh, Hindus. Yep. Uh, and gives the impression, not impression, it's said textually, 
that both sides shared this concern. But if you see the readout from the White House, there's absolutely no mention of Bangladesh or minorities. Can you imagine? Uh, now, here was an occasion, because from the Indian side, we had concerns that the United States is totally ignoring this issue. Now, here was an occasion uh, where they could have uh, gone along you know, with what the Prime Minister said and acknowledged that uh, there was a concern, but they haven't mm -hmm. done so. So they miss, missed another occasion uh, to speak up uh, about the security of minorities in Bangladesh, yep. which seems that the only concern that they have is about minorities in India, because the State Department keeps issuing reports on minorities in India. <laughs> this is beyond the comprehension. Uh, yeah. And this just shows more and more suspicion as to you know, what the United States uh, game is. And finally, the uh, United States knows very well what the uh, Islamist uh, groups uh, uh, are, uh, are, can do in Bangladesh, have done in Bangladesh, problems we've had with them in the past, problem with the PNP uh, government the insecurity of our northeastern uh, states, uh, the excellent collaboration that we obtained uh, from the Hasina government, which was very vital for us strategically in terms of not only the development of our northeast, but also the Act East policy. Now, the stakes of India in Bangladesh, strategic stakes are very high. So why doesn't the United States recognize that and uh, help us preserve those stakes? rather than undermine them by the kind of uh, policy they're uh, pursuing at present, which gives the impression that we are not on the same wavelength. You know, sir, wavelength is something which is quite a debatable question, and especially as US goes close to its election, one can realize, I don't think even the US knows what it, what, what it wants and what it's doing right now, because one part of the government is saying one thing. And if you see John Danilowitz's tweet, and if I may just uh, read that out sir, for you, if you don't mind, uh, he says, just, yeah, he says, and I quote, hey, White House, Sec uh, State Department, and when are Portis and Secretary Blinken going to talk to Chief Advisor of Government of Bangladesh? to discuss the situation in Bangladesh and explore ways for US to help the country in historic transformation after the end of a dictatorship. So they've, they've kind of decided it. It is a bit unseemly for the US and India to be talking about Bangladesh at this moment in history. It gives an impression that neither the US or nor the India Indians have learned the lesson after getting Bangladesh policy so wrong in recent months. This is a very bad look for both Delhi and Washington. Do better. Well, this guy was a consul general in Peshawar. He was a deputy high commissioner or something in Bangladesh. I don't know if he's still a serving diplomat, but he, is, he's typically... he was in Bangladesh. He's one of the one of the. No, but is he still a serving diplomat? He's on some think... assignments, sir. You know, you know how these guys work. Special representative, uh, but... this and that, yeah, and the other. It's totally improper uh, yeah. for a ex diplomat or a kind of a quasi, -quasi diplomat uh, to talk like uh, to talk like this and for the mm -hmm. State Department or uh, others not to pull him up. What surprised me is that uh, he uh, put uh, Shashi Tharoor on the defensive. And Shashi Tharoor then uh, apologized virtually uh, that he had got it all wrong. He was given information that there were some uh, atrocities against Hindus, but it proved to be wrong and this and that. And and uh, this fellow who uh, we talked about, I can't pronounce his name, but it was delighted that Shashi Tharoor had uh, gone back uh, was shameful what, what I said earlier. Uh, and then, I'm sorry I have to say this, uh, you have the print uh, publishing this article from this uh, Rehman Shoban, I think, uh, or whatever his name is, Yeah. Uh, well, the 10 things India must do. I looked very carefully at that article. Actually, I could rebut many of the things uh, that he said. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and of course, the central point of, was that uh, the minorities in Bangladesh are safer than minorities in India. And I was surprised that Sh Shekhar Gupta actually retweeted that and amplified that message. And Rand Corporation fellow immediately picks it up and amplifies it further. So I don't know why we are also uh, become a party to this kind of Bangladeshi propaganda. I, I can understand why it is. Because since Modi has raised the issue of Hindus, 
and since uh, Modi uh, and BJP are Hindutva types, uh, and therefore you have to counter them by saying that you know the problem of minorities in India is worse than the problem of uh, minorities in Bangladesh. I mean, yeah. this kind of politics that journal journalists play in this country is sad. Extremely so. You know, you don't play on lives of people. Let's let's kind of face that, and it's it's quite funny, uh, sir. I want to talk to you. Let's let's kind of zoom out of of the game. Uh, you, you know, this whole thing has been done to kind of create that hegemony, sort of a structure that the U.S. wants in the region. Uh, a lot of people kind of blame China in the middle of it, but you know, I think that that perspective has changed, and the feedback from China is China is very worried about this one because students on the road, regime change, whoa, those are things that they don't want to hear. How do you think the Chinese are going to respond to this? This is a complete well, rollback from China, of China from Bangladesh. It's complete a complete switch off. A couple of things uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina seemed to have suggested that during her last visit to Beijing, she didn't get what she wanted. Yeah. And, uh, uh, what the Chinese offered in terms of uh, financial support was a pittance compared to what her expectation was. Hmm. Uh, and then, of course, the belief, belief that she cut short her visit because uh, she didn't, uh, she was not received well, though ultimately uh, Xi Jinping met her, but her principal interlocutor was the Prime Minister uh, of China. Uh, that's one part. Uh, the other part is that. Uh, for a China, even if it is not directly involved in the uh, situation, uh, if India uh, receives a uh, blow in Bangladesh, uh, it is to their advantage. Uh, the whole Actis policy, uh, you know, becomes uh, very difficult uh, uh, to implement. Gets very complicated. Uh, the northeast area, which is a very sensitive area for us in which the Ch Chinese have interfered in the past, uh, becomes uh, a potential ground for uh, calibrated interference uh, by them. Mm. The situation in Myanmar, in any case, uh, is, is troubling for everyone, including uh, China. But uh, China has the resources and the, and the manner in which they operate, they can take advantage of these unstable uh, situations. Uh, they have a lot of money to throw. They can supply arms. Uh, they have ways also to uh, promote uh, certain uh, groups to advance uh, their interests. Uh, they don't do it very openly, uh, unlike the Americans and the West. They do it more uh, subtly. Uh, and then, you know, after all, Arunachal Pradesh is very much part of our Northeast. So if there, if there, India is a bit uh, destabilized. Uh, they will not see any, they will see some virtue uh, mm. in that. And then at a more international level, uh, it, it, it would appear that India has received that rebuff. It can't handle its periphery. Uh, and also, if the impression in India in some circles is that the Americans are uh, not uh, uh, cooperative and are willing to uh, accept a blow to India's strategic interests, then what impact would this have on the developing India-US ties, Quad and Indo-Pacific and everything else? Would that then create some suspicion and wrinkles and mistrust? And if it does, it's to China's advantage. So there can be many subtle ways in which China uh, can uh, profit uh, f uh, from, the, from the situation. And then finally, uh, you know, uh, Jamaat and this and that, these people, they've always been very pro-China. Uh, uh, so, uh, and there's always this, uh, this part of the Bangladesh po uh, political uh, establishment, uh, which, uh, like in the case of other neighbors, wants to begin China to balance India. Mm. After all, even under Sheikh Hasina, I mean, we need not be that starry-eyed uh, about her. Uh, she brought in China in a big way. Yep. Uh, the biggest defense partner and gave her projects, sports, this and that. Um, so, and I have and I have said that, rightly or wrongly, that uh, he, he would have done that in order to uh, placate 
and manage those lobbies uh, within Bangladesh, including in our own party, uh, mm. who may have wanted to uh, keep the China card in their hands right. in uh, dealing with India, and then projected as a kind of a more balanced uh, Bangladesh foreign policy that they were not selling every, they're not becoming stooges of India because they're bringing uh, China in. I remember this Bashani fellow a long time ago. <laughs> he's, he's quite very pro-Chinese, this Molana Bashani. Mm, mm, mm. So, so there are those uh, elements uh, in, in uh, Bangladesh, which the Chinese will with a lot more in their hands in terms of uh, uh, financial resources and propaganda tools can take advantage of. Hmm. That is indeed interesting. Let's kind of zoom out a little further. So Modi Saab also went to Ukraine and uh, uh, it was amazing that uh, that t-shirt wearing clown, if I may, I'm sorry if I'm using that language, but there is no way else to describe a person who basically tries to insult a guest coming to your house. Well, you know, I have said a lot about this. Uh, he's very spoiled uh, by yeah. the internet, by the West. He's been given tremendous uh, exposure. Uh, he's played the victim card exceedingly well. He has tremendous communication skills. After all, he became president because of his acting skills and uh, uh, communication skills. Uh, and he thinks that he can press the right buttons in order to uh, obtain support from his viewpoint. And, and they've gone all out in the West to mm -hmm. give him full exposure, even in areas which actually diminish his political stature, appearing on the Vogue magazine with his wife, uh, going to the Eurovision context, going to Cannes Film Festival, <laughs> apart from, of course, addressing the uh, US Congress. And then uh, Mr. Starmer, the British Prime Minister, in his first cabinet meeting, first cabinet meeting, he invites uh, Zelensky to uh, participate, uh, which has given Zelensky such a sense of entitlement that he's been insulting uh, even his uh, biggest benefactors, whether Americans, yeah. the Americans, uh, British, British Defense Secretary in the past. Uh, look at the statement he made. Uh, the French Macron, the Polish Prime Minister at that time, the German uh, Chancellor. Uh, he's been. Uh, He's been uh, lecturing them, you're not doing enough, you need to do enough. We are not only fighting for ourselves, we are fighting for you, you must accept this responsibility, etc., uh, etc. Et so, in this broad background, uh, for him to then to uh, have a view on uh, our Prime Minister's uh, uh, role in the situation and what we can do, uh, is understandable <laughs> that he, as has he been talking down to others, uh, in a sense, he's just talked down uh, at, at our prime minister, uh, you know, saying that uh, again, reiterating uh, something which we explained time and again, time and again about buying oil from Russia. So, what's the point in raising this and trying to? Uh, morally put us uh, uh, on the defensive and then talking about uh, his peace plan as if that's the only peace plan uh, that uh, should be accepted by the international uh, community. And then going on to say that, uh, look, you know, if you're interested in holding the next peace summit, of course, we would welcome it um, because of the global south, etc., etc. But then, frankly, uh, you have to join the first communique. Uh, I mean, it's, it's laying conditions uh, on uh, for India if it was interested in promoting uh, dialogue and, and diplomacy. This is this is immature. This is not serious uh, uh, diplomacy. But he thinks he can he can uh, he can get away with it. Don't mind you. Uh, this is something that needs to be said. Uh, if you look at uh, the joint statement and our foreign minister's press conference, uh, we did not yield on substance at all. Even on the issue of the peace summit, the minister said very clearly that 
not the only game in town. There can be other ways of addressing peace. Uh, and all stakeholders should be there. There should be an innovative way of uh, finding a, a solution. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and then uh, the joint statement uh, refers to the Ukraine conflict. But interestingly, uh, the word Russia is not mentioned. Yes. So we got our way. Not what, whatever we wanted. It's about diplomacy. Sitting in Kiev, in a joint statement, on the central issue for Ukraine, yeah. and it's and it's uh, seething hatred for Russia. Uh, the word Russia is not mentioned. Yeah, it, I mean that that I think was a superb shot <laughs> that needs a pat pat on the back. Uh, as far as this is concerned, I agree with you. I think Minister Jay Shankar gave it back in kind, sitting in Kiev. Back to the same gentleman, it didn't need to come from the prime minister, it actually came from the foreign minister. So that's actually quite a degrade, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I wonder what, what you would say about that diplomat diplomatically. But just see, the situation is very weird. And what is India trying to do, people don't know. My perception is you're just trying to create a paradigm of a conversation. Uh, because you don't want to get into this muddy water of mediation. You need to have a place where you can actually say, okay, fine, I'll pass messages and, you know, reduce the tensions where things flare up. Would that something, would you look at? So as a former diplomat who probably has done conflict negotiations as well, how do you foresee this situation? I think uh, we were in a situation where... Uh, a visit to Ukraine or engaging Ukraine directly in this manner became almost inevitable. Uh, you know, Prime Minister's visit to Russia uh, at a time when the NATO summit was taking place in Washington, uh, and also this incident of the hospital uh, yeah. was uh, exploited to the hilt uh, by the West, uh, and a lot of open pressure. Uh, by the United States uh, on this subject, to the point saying that even 24 hours before the visit, and even during the visit, they were in touch with us. Touch with us for, for what? So uh, that's one. The other is that, uh, and of course, this forced the Prime Minister uh, to say a few things uh, uh, in front of Putin, hmm. uh, which was a bit of a lecturing to the Russian president. Reminding him that I had said that uh, today is not an era of war, and adding to that, that solutions cannot be found on the battlefield. And then expressing himself very strongly, very strongly on the killing of children in conflict. Now, <laughs> Putin is a very seasoned diplomat. He would have understood why uh, yeah, yeah. I'm saying this, and uh, which is the public that he was. Addressing because after that they had four, or five, four, four and a half hours of private conversation. So I think the Putin took it in his stride. Uh, but uh, and I know this uh, from the inside that uh, uh, Prime Minister told Putin that uh, uh, Zelensky was pressing him to come to uh, Kiev and that he planned to go. And the Russians, to their credit, just as in the case of our relations with the United States, they never tell us, don't do this, don't do that. Unlike the Americans who tell us, you know, dilute your relations with Russia. The Russians never tell us to dilute our relations with the United States. And the same thing about Ukraine. Now, I don't know what Putin exactly said, but to my mind, what he would might have had in mind is that if you want to go, go. You will discover for yourself that this man... Uh, is uh, you can't deal with this man, yeah. and uh, others who have tried, and that Russia itself has tried. He is in hock totally uh, with the West; they totally manipulate him. And you will also discover that you won't go, go very far for him, <laughs> with him. Uh, therefore, try your luck. <laughs> Maybe this is what he had in mind. I think uh, Prime Minister may have felt that. Uh, let me sort of get uh, the West off my back. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, which uh, hasn't been said before, but I was just thinking of it, is that once he has done this, 
then his hand is freer with regard to Russia. See, earlier, you know, too much Russia, you know, you don't do this, you don't do that. And, you know, once he has done that and covered his flanks, then he can proceed and uh, deal with Russia even uh, more no, intensely. More. Mm -hmm. Intensively, because you can always say that I believe in dialogue and diplomacy. I went there. I did my best. I'm still willing to do my best. If you want me to play a role, I'm willing to play a role. If you want me to pass messages, I'm willing to pass messages. But uh, no solution can be found unless the interests of all stakeholders are uh, accommodated. And the solutions have to be innovative, which means it can't be on the basis of Zelensky's 10 point uh, peace mm -hmm. proposal. So maybe uh, at the end of the day, having, uh, let's say, taken the Americans, especially off our back, um, he can have a little more of a free hand in dealing with this uh, Russia Ukraine conflict. That makes sense, sir. That makes a lot of sense. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, uh, you know, I would firmly believe that. The, the Russians also would understand, yeah. That, I mean, you guys also go deal with China and all that stuff. We all have our compulsions. Let's, you know, kind of not bring this in the middle. I think uh, they're 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 pretty seasoned in their game. So I, I, as you say very clearly, that I don't see a backlash, as to say, from Russia. Uh, but so you know, the the the, the other thing, thing, is, the other thing is that for the West, the fact that he embraced Putin became a geopolitical issue. Can you imagine? <laughs> the Diplomacy of the West. So he, he's he's made three embraces of uh, uh, Zelensky while in uh, uh, Kiev, uh, also into a geopolitical issue for, for the West. So, in, so all Trump. the all the people that you and I both spar with, sir, if you know what I mean, you know, on, online. So as a matter of fact, one of them actually uh, put out a tweet. Oh, so he he hugged uh, Zelensky also. That means his hug has no meaning. So I tweeted and I said, yeah, you monkey, I have been saying you guys don't understand Indian foreign policy. Why do you want to wade into it? Now, the sheer factor that you've actually written this, that means you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And you still comment on it. So this this whole superiority business needs to stop with you guys. And it's so funny. You know, it's uh, it's amazing. But, but sir, generally around the world, when you see as you're going close to the elections, if you see the rimland of the world, that is like literally lighting up on fire today. Uh, you know, you've got Ukraine, you've got Israel, which is, I mean, Israel, Lebanon, now that is starting up. Iran is doing something here and there. The Red Sea, you've got Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan, that region, which is blowing up. You've got Myanmar, which has an issue. Bangladesh, which is now there. And recently, you have another court-backed protest in Indonesia, as if we required anything else. We also had some stuff in Malaysia. We also have stuff in, Indo uh, in, in, in uh, Thailand. Uh, if you Continue this process. I think the next one big country after Indonesia should be Laos, Cambodia, or the big big fruit, which is China. So, what's happening here, sir? Well, it's, it's not as if uh, these things not happened before. I mean, Thailand has had a change of governments uh, very very often. Yeah, uh, and it's surprising that Thaksin runs away, then his sister becomes. Uh, president and uh, I don't know if she's run away or not, then the daughter becomes the president. The army plays a very important role uh, yeah. in, in these things in, in Thailand. Uh, in, in Indonesia, I think the new president, uh, the former defense minister, uh, who has been sanctioned by the United States, uh, is, is a bit of a thorn in the flesh probably. But then, you know, our entire effort has been to, within uh, the Indo-Pacific concept and Board, uh, to somehow reach out to Indonesia mm. and bring them to the fold uh, of uh, the new strategies uh, to uh, contain China, if you like. So to what extent uh, uh, disruptions or, uh, or instability in Indonesia will make the task of the Americans themselves, apart from our own effort uh, to, uh, to consolidate uh, the participation of Indonesia in the kind of forums that have been created with India, Australia, Indonesia forum, things like that. Um, so I think that is a bit, uh, a bit uh, disruptive. Uh, but further afield, uh, uh, Vietnam is all right. I mean, Vietnam continues to play at both ends of the wicket. Uh, 
Uh, it has big problems with China, but it reached out to China. Their new leader has just visited uh, China, so they want to, despite all the problems in the South China Sea, uh, they maintain this kind of a balance. Uh, Philippines uh, is having problems with China. Uh, the United States is uh, backing the Philippines, uh, but I think the, uh, the United States is very worried that the situation should, shouldn't go out of hand, which explains uh, why uh, uh, Jake Sullivan has gone yes. to China, about to go to China. He's uh, on the way, sir. He's on the way, which is unusual uh, with, with a Biden administration, which is neither here nor there. With it. Actually, the United States is without uh, really a functional president. Uh, at this point in time, when the things are so fluid, the uh, United States wouldn't want uh, confrontation with China. And that explains probably why uh, he, he, he's going there. Uh, Myanmar has always been unstable. I mean, I can't remember where uh, they've had a period of sustained uh, stability because the army has always played a role. Now, of course, it is becoming even more dangerous because the army has lost control over large parts of uh, yes, sir. Uh, Myanmar. Uh, Pakistan, uh, well, has been in trouble for a long time, <laughs> you know, which is not a bad thing <laughs> uh, for us. Iran, if you notice, uh, the new Iranian uh, uh, foreign minister, Ragchi, uh, mm. he's making very very um, accommodative noises. He, Iran doesn't want uh, a, yeah. a, an open conflict with the United States. Mm. And Ragchi, if you read the back channel of uh, Burns, who's the CIA chief, uh, how they uh, actually uh, worked on the nuclear question uh, with Iran. Iraqi was his uh, counterpart. And they, they, and, uh, they had a very good uh, equation. Uh, so I think he has been put in, uh, in place uh, at this moment by Khamenei, uh, the spiritual leader, in order to manage uh, the situation better and have a channel of dialogue open with the Americans. Uh, the, the big problem is, uh, is Netanyahu and Israel. Uh, and the Americans, for domestic political reasons and in part ideological reasons, uh, they, they're not able to have a viable policy. Uh, they, they, they can see that what uh, Netanyahu is doing is eroding America's position in the entire Arab world uh, to, in different degrees. And then, of course, puts into question uh, all that talk about American values and everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, they keep supplying them arms, more and more arms. Uh, so on the one hand, the effort is to have some kind of a ceasefire. On the other hand, uh, they give uh, Netanyahu all the support he wants to reject the ceasefire. And the attention has been taken away by the Western press on what is happening on the West Bank. Yeah. Uh, the, the Palestinians can say what they want. They can appear on RT and <laughs> make their claims, but it doesn't develop into an international narrative. That will happen if the Western press takes it up, takes it up but they're not taking it up. Uh, so it's a very, very, it is potentially a very serious situation. The Americans have moved another aircraft carrier into the region, thinking that if the whole thing blows up, uh, then they have to be ready uh, to douse the fires. Uh, but it's, it's sad that uh, they have allowed the situation uh, to go this far. Yes, sir. It's okay. I mean, uh, Hamas is, <laughs> is, is a terrorist organization, no doubt. Uh, they can certainly talk about. Uh, Palestinian rights and this and that. But if the international position today is to which India subscribes, that no cause justifies the use of terrorism, uh, then uh, to say that uh, Palestinian rights uh, have been uh, uh, trodden over, uh, disregarded uh, for so many decades, uh, and there have been these excesses by the uh, Israeli military so many Palestinians have been imprisoned, 
the, the West Bank, uh, whole swathes of the West Bank are now under the control of the settlers. These are all genuine things. But uh, how do you then say that all this justifies the use of terrorism? Terrorism. You want That's to sympathize point. with what is happening, but uh, countries like India are caught into in this situation that we don't obviously would want to support or support the excesses of the uh, Iranians, of the Israelis. But at the same time, we can't ignore the fact of terrorism. Uh, for uh, And if uh, this thing really blows up, then it has very serious consequences uh, for us. Our equities uh, in, in this larger West Asian region can be very severely compromised if uh, if there is an all-out uh, all-out conflict in this region uh, but uh, the key basically is in the hands of the united states mm. uh, but the united states doesn't want to talk to iran <laughs> they don't have diplomatic ties they they don't have the channels of communication uh, so it's a it, it's a very complex situation with no easy uh, solutions in view. Last question, sir, on Indian inter internal situation is that you see the Americans interfering with politicians, civil society. Although, yeah, they've been doing that for ages. I have worked in Delhi enough to see all these meetings happening in large five star hotels. They've been happening for decades now. Uh, some of them are just harmless, but in today's scenario, when we saw what we, we saw in Bangladesh, how do you put that into perspective? And what should we do, sir? Sorry. Well, the, a couple of things. One is that our internal situation, uh, politically, uh, has become quite divisive. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a bit like the American things, American system with this polarization. Gee. Uh, the kind of language that is used against uh, the American exactly the same, sir. Exactly the same. Is, is the same that is being used against our prime minister, mocking yeah. him, ridiculing him, no respect at all for the government and his, and the prime minister. Uh, every issue, on every issue, the rights and wrongs are not really discussed, uh, uh, or it, it, a way has to be found how. The prime minister can be attacked, or the blame laid on uh, at his feet for everything. Uh, so, in this situation, uh, since we are an open society and we have very strong links uh, with the West, especially the United States at every level, people to people, business, academic, uh, bureaucracy, uh, think tanks, civil society. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which uh, uh, the foundations in America and other organizations can play on the divisions within our society and promote more and more uh, instability if they can. With willing collaboration of uh, the opposition in India, because the opposition has not made any bones about uh, getting foreign uh, intervention to save democracy in India. <laughs> So, uh, and now you added this caste business, including they want to know what was the caste complexion of Miss India and things like that. You've gone to this ridiculous extent. Every, you see, the British uh, focus a lot on caste, caste not merely as an anthropo anthropological study, but in order to divide up the Hindu society. And we are following the same game. Uh, we follow the same game in our electoral system in any case. Uh, mm. But now uh, we are mainstreaming it far more by asking for a caste census and everything else, which will then divide the Hindu society even more, create pockets of vested interests, which will then look for reservation and this and that, or some special consideration uh, by the state. Uh, so constant demands that will affect the political process and elections as it is they are very caste oriented now they have to be minutely caste oriented in in the future anyway in this kind of a 
system, there's a lot of scope for foreign interference. True. And uh, the United States uh, has one of its biggest embassies in the world in India. And there are a lot of consulates uh, in India too. Uh, and they're very active in, uh, in keeping a tab on our politics. Uh, the US uh, Consul General in Hyderabad goes and meets Ovesi and talks about shared, shared values and concerns. So I don't know what the shared values and concerns are with Ovesi. Uh, it can't be foreign policy because on the issue of uh, uh, Israel and Gaza, uh, there's no shared value and concern between the exactly. uh, United States and uh, Ovesi. But the only shared concern could be about minorities, no? Uh, now you have the U.S. diplomats going to Jammu and Kashmir and meeting the national conference who have now announced their agenda, which is to reverse all that the BJP uh, has done. Uh, now, this is what is on the surface. What may be behind the surface, uh, only our intelligence agencies would know. People like you and I uh, won't really know. How much of this is being monitored? What assessment we make uh, of this is not something uh, that uh, one can have a, a considered, considered view on. But the long and short is, and mind you, this is a point I'd like to make. We have very clearly a whole host of US foundations and organizations who are working on creating more problems for India within. Mm. We have the entire media, uh, which is uh, anti-Modi, anti-BJP, anti hindutva anti both the official, before the official, uh, both at the official level, at the media level, at the think tank level, they are playing up and focusing on uh, issues of minorities and uh, uh, human rights and stuff like that. Now, see, no government can be totally immune uh, from what is widely the perspectives uh, that is shared by the society at large. Correct. The people who are involved in policy making, who have a view on external relations, who are well informed. If they have this kind of a jaundiced negative view of India, which they propagate all the time, then the governments can't say, no, no, this is their view, but it's not ours. No, it's, 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 a, it's all intertwined. Yeah. Which is why uh, we have to very carefully assess uh, the problems and dangers on the ground in terms of greater foreign interference in our political system and weakening the role of the center to more active subnational uh, diplomacy and the issue of federalism that is being raised by the opposition constantly uh, is something which can be exploited as part of the subnational <laughs> diplomacy of some external powers. That is very, very interesting. So I think, you know, uh, as you said uh, offline, we were talking that it might not be wise to blare up the way you would do to another country because it's the US and it, it, you know, you know how it is. They're a, they're a big power, and that's something that you need to acknowledge. But somewhere down the line, I guess, as you're saying, we need to create a uh, some sort of a paradigm where a balancing act of some sort needs to be kind of put into place, so that you know a certain amount of leverage, a certain amount of protection. Uh, you know, in Bombay, they say the kya? Uh, protection money to you, so that <laughs> the same gunda doesn't come and kill you. So I guess something like that will need to be done going forward uh, because the gunda of US is is of course quite uh, quite active nowadays. In any case, sir, it, it's always a pleasure talking to you and My learning. To, thank you so much for the time and hope to see you back very soon. Bye bye. 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 Namaskar. Bye.